Good morning. Um, serious apologies about being late. Um, no excuses about traffic. Um, I'm excited to be here representing Clarity with a background in the R&D um, with over 20 years at the CSRO in South Africa and CSIR uh, here in Melbourne. Um, I'm now excited to be representing Clarity as a way, together with my colleague Andreas, who's here today, of translating research into industrial solutions. Clarity is based in Melbourne um, and was founded to assist CSRO with a drive to translate science outcomes into industry implementable products. In particular, to develop and help commercialize the next generation of mineral processing instrumentation. So why clarity? There are numerous challenges in the mineral processing sector, and some of the bigger ones include a global decline in the ore grades and increasingly variable feed. Coupled with this, maintaining expertise is becoming harder with a trend to increasingly transient workforce and a decline in research translation to implementation. While analogous instrumentation may exist in other industries, such as the oil and gas industry, these instruments do not easily migrate across to the much harsher environment of the mineral processing. The lack of eyes and brains, particularly in the lower tiered mine operations, limits the ability to control processes and objectives such as real-time improvement and value chain optimization. These operations often lack the ability to implement early stage sensors into process outcomes. The digitization of mining is increasingly seen as a key priority across all operations, whether they be large or small and irrespective of the commodity. Here are some comments from and buzzwords that we got from this week's Ozmine conference in Brisbane. However, while upstream processes can use wonderful buzzwords and phrases like dynamic optimization, autonomous systems, real time, machine learning algorithms, digital disruption, and continuous control loops, this is still far from the progress for processes downstream of communution. <coughs> Clarity aims to bridge the instrumentation gap of new technologies and industry solutions. With our background, our primary focus is to currently on the low-hanging fruit at CSIRO. The technologies shown here are at various stages of implementation and development. And the two that we'll be currently focusing on in this presentation today are the Interfloat and the IOR, the online rheometer. This is based on analysis of the level of readiness, risk, and their impact that they'll have in industry. However, the technology suite for consideration by Clarity should not be constrained by what just CSRO has to offer. key aim that we focus on is on the particle-laden processes downstream of comminution. And our objective in this domain is to facilitate the development, implementation, and commercialization of mineral-specific instrumentation in a drive towards control and automation solutions. So a key aim is to further development of mineral specific instrumentation. And this can be done by harnessing the significant miniaturization power of computing to allow complex computation in the instrument itself. And so providing an intelligent, pre-processed and timely data rather than producing the buzzword which is big data. Another key aim is to drive positive site behaviors through training, data visualization, 
and enabling particularly the small to mid-tier producers who have limited or possibly no instrumentation or monitoring implemented. Clarity seeks to transform science into innovative instrumentation and control solutions applicable to an industrial and mineral processing context. This can be through the identification of new growth areas relevant to the mineral processing industry with a global focus and evaluation of the technical and commercial risk using a portfolio pipeline based approach through to commercialization. We offer a differentiating relationship with the mineral processing industry that offers solutions and continual improvement partnerships. Additionally, we can provide guidance on proof of concept studies, developing a business case and project management. Our focus is in driving towards and beyond minimum viable product through site-based demonstration. With experience spanning research, site trials and commissioning, we are well placed to gain buy-in from the site and collaborate with researchers and the end user in the scope and planning stages. This includes the identification of improvement opportunities, development of an investment case with clear commercial objectives, optimization of sensing and control configuration, management of customized construction, preparation of the operator and technical documentation, and conducting off-site pre-commissioning. We also have expertise in on-site commissioning, including site installation and safety reviews and operator training. We work with researchers and the end user to ensure that any technology solution is independently trialled and validated on site by providing site support and remote diagnostics, preparing trend and exception reporting and developing business case for the technology uptake. Ongoing customer support is fostered with the aim to embed the technology with work management practices, seeking and implementing process and control improvements, and re-evaluating the opportunities through advanced analytics. We are currently working with the CSRO to implement their new technology suite. And this diagram shows how the four technologies that we are considering uh, initially address the need to close the control loop on the downstream flotation, settling and slurry transportation sections. In particular today I'll highlight the interfloat, which is not there, there it is, and the online rheometer or the IOR. We are implementing these two instruments on a very forgiving mine site. It's an antimony and gold mine site in Victoria, aiding the continued development to minimum viable uh, status for these two instruments. And the processing side of the mine has a low level of sensing and they do not have monitoring or control implemented on site. The interfloat provides the ability to detect this interface between the pulp and the froth phases in a flotation cell. It consists of a shaft on the left hand side, this picture, with multiple prongs mounted on the side of a cell and designed sufficiently long to cover the expected operation levels on either side of the pulp and the froth interface. The gas buildup at each of those prongs on the shaft um, is embedded, is used in an embedded advanced algorithm to detect the interface and this is enhanced using the conductivities 
at each of those prongs. This is different to any other technology being currently used in industry and has the ability to change the way flotation cells are being actively controlled. So looking at the current installation in Victoria, while the unit is customizable to suit the particular application, for this version, the prongs are spaced 25 millimeters apart over a height of 500 millimeters. It's fitted with an LED and LCD display, enabling local visualization of the level. It also uses encrypted mobile telecommunication connectivity, which provides remote monitoring of the process outputs as well as the raw data. Didn't realize I'd taken photos of myself and would have been better to have ones of Andreas as well. The photos show the probe mounted on the inside of the flotation cell on the top right, with a controller and display unit on the outside, which is the bottom of the, the left hand picture. In the housing contains an LCD display showing the interface level, which is updated every two seconds. Additionally, the LED display provides a visual detection of the changes in the depth. Data, both instantaneous level and weighted averages, is transferred via wireless communications to an AWS server every 30 seconds and can be shown on an IoT dashboard in a standard platform agnostic web browser. Finer details of the raw data is collected on a removable storage device, USB, and can be used for detailed diagnostics. It also allows data transfer to catch up if for whatever reason the wireless communication is interrupted. Similarly, operating system updates can be uploaded onto the controller remotely with minimal cycle downtime and without local operator input being required. The graph on the right shows an example of the gas voidage response at each of the prongs. I haven't put all of the prongs, I've just put a selection of them, it gets pretty noisy, but also gives you an example uh, of, of the level of data that comes from the unit. And this shows how the, the voidage of each of those prongs is interpreted to an interface level, which is the orange plot at the top on the, on the scale on the right hand side. This is then the value of the interface is then displayed locally at the flotation cell on the LCD screen. The time period on the bottom scale shows the cell operation in response to changes in the ore grade and operational changes made due to upstream and downstream processes and constraints. Now I realize this is not going to be e that easy to read, but for those who can see, the prongs that have a higher number uh, indicate an increased depth in the flotation cell. So with the response, you may be able to detect that the deeper prongs of 10 to 20 consistently have a lower voidage. The higher prongs of 1 to 5 more consistently have a higher voidage, which is expected as they are typically in the froth phase. The prongs 5, between 5 and 10, tend to transition between these as they are around the interface level and tracks between those based on the operational changes. With the development of this Mark 1B version, there are still a few inconsistencies with the voidage measured at each of the prongs across the time span. However, the algorithm is robust enough to interpret the interface level. And this was shown through validation when compared to manual level measurements conducted by the plant, showing good correlation within the unit's measurement resolution. 
The graph also represents an example of big data. While the level of information presented here, and even the base raw data itself, is important for deeper analysis, for sensing improvement, the important part is providing contextualized information to the right people at the right time. And for this particular mind site, the important output is just the interface level. The Interfloat is capable of providing targeted outputs as a 4 to 20 milliamp signal. However, as this mind site does not have a traditional monitoring or control interface, we are busy developing an Internet of Things dashboard. This will enable the operators to monitor the trend in real time on a laptop or on a smartphone. Here we've prepared a sample dashboard using simulated data over a five month period. The instantaneous interface level shown in blue across the level there and the moving average shown in orange are calculated in the Interflow device itself and these are then transmitted via secure 3G protocol to a web server for representation on the dashboard to which the mine will have access for monitoring purposes. I'll cover more of the discussion on the dashboard development a bit later in the presentation. Current operation has focused on detection of the pulp and froth interface, which is the interface there between the blue and the gray, but measured as a distance from the lip. Next steps will be focused on the froth phase, in particular determining the froth and air interface. And from that, we'll be able to determine the froth height. Borrowing on the words of flotation experts, monitoring the pulp electrochemistry, i.e. the pH and redox potential, is an essential part of processing polymetallic base metal sulfide ores. Controlling the pulp electrochemistry is often the primary means of ensuring flotation selectivity of specific minerals. So the best means of visualizing the voidage as a function of the cell depth and phase will be assessed together with the incorporation of the EH and pH. While conductivity at the moment is detected at each of the prongs on the unit, it is not a, not a calibrated value and is currently used as a qualitative means uh, to facilitate the interface level detection method. We are looking at incorporating temperature of the pulp phase and redesigning the prong manufacturing process to allow measurement of the true pulp conductivity. We are now actively looking to address these additional sensing parameters to enable control of the flotation cell, leading to a significant improvement in recovery. The Intelligent Online Rheometer, or IOR, is the second technology that I'll be presenting today. This unit was born out of rheological test work that the CSRO used to conduct in a laboratory on samples acquired from industry. While the tests are comprehensive themselves in describing the slurry rheology, the turnaround time meant that the answers represented a snapshot of operation in processes where there are much faster turnaround time. The CSRO therefore developed a deployable unit which can be taken to site for evaluation purposes or used as a dedicated field instrument. Here you can see the IOR which is the blue unit on the bottom. Under or to the bottom right of a thickener, which is at uh, the Victorian mine site, the Antimony and Gold Mine, that we've got it implemented at. The graph on the right-hand side shows a typical rheogram, 
which can be developed uh, and uh, then announced and further analysis. That rheogram is generated from over two pipelines in the unit itself. The yield stress is used, often used as a proxy for wider rheological characteristics or physico-chemical properties. It is, however, highly dependent on the measurement and modelling methods. The two most self-consistent methods are vein measurement or rotational rheometry with a yield pseudoplastic model fit. However, these methods do not agree and produce different values for strongly networked materials. As the vein is a static test and rotational rheometry is a dynamic one. Using the Bingham model to a rheogram to fit the rheogram is dependent on the shear rate range chosen and will tend to be inconsistent and larger in magnitude than other methods. The IOR instead extract the yield stress from the herschel bulkley model. This and the inclusion of a low shear rate measurements significantly improves the estimation of yield stress for a dynamic system. So how does it work? The online rheometer is essentially a traditional pipe loop. It's been designed to continually assess a side stream from the process fluid and it's designed more specifically to address the presence of fine sub-20 micron material with the inclusion of clays, which diverges from classical Newtonian fluids. It has been designed using industrial equipment and instrumentation and fitted inside a rugged sealable housing as shown on the left hand side. While the system is capable of sampling, testing and analyzing the stream continuously. This kind of frequency is not required and something more like four cycles per hour would be sufficient to describe the variable rheology of this particular mine's flow conditions. The IOR is designed to run unattended and can be controlled and monitored remotely and in this case we use a PLC. It also has the capability of outputting parameters such as the yield stress and viscosity via a 4 to 20 milliamp signal. And again, this is not implemented on the particular mine as they do not have the capability to take this kind of output. Measuring the rheologic properties using methods such as the slump test, vein test, etc., are not designed nor capable of representing the dynamic system of flow in a pipeline. Whereas the capillary rheometer is a well-established method for measuring complex rheology. The online rheometer uses a variation of the capillary rheometer by measuring the pressure drop over two sections of pipe of different diameter. This is conducted over a range of volumetric flow rates so that a full rheogram can be generated and ultimately used for control in a range of unit operations. The diameter of the pipes needs to be customized for the rheology likely to be assessed and experienced in the operations. So careful sampling and pre-screening of a proposed application, i.e. is there in fact a rheological problem, is essential for successful implementation. We have received a number of samples where the sample material was water or coarse sand with negligible fines, in which case there is no point in trying to fit or apply the IOR. Using two pipes with different internal diameters allows measurement of a wide range of shear rates and the ability to detect the settling of coarse material through differences in the responses over the two pipes. While capillary rheometry is a robust measuring method for homogeneous fluids, homogeneity is problematic for suspensions. 
To expand on that, a pseudo-homogeneous suspension, which is isotropic at the measurement scale, in laminar flow will produce results from both pipes that, so that the results sit on a single rheogram. However, if coarse material settles or when trained gas is present, then the output from the different pipe diameters do not match on a single rheogram. So to show an example of that, this is an example from previous work on the IRO using copper tailings from a thickener underflow. While the density is a poor proxy for transport properties, the IRO is ne nevertheless able of measuring this and uses this as an input. And for this slurry was determined at 1,500 kilograms per meter cubed. In this case, the data from both pipelines do not match. You can see from the orange and blue curves. Especially not in this, the rates in the region of shear rate overlap due to thixotropic effects where the suspension is not fully sheared. This reinforced the need for full stream and system characterization prior to deployment with careful customization of the pipe diameters. In this case, the smaller pipe diameters were fitted before deployment so that the range with higher shear rates could be implemented. Here's an example of the data from the IRR deployed at the Intimity Gold Mine in Victoria compared to a lab laboratory coexist test. The slurry density on the side stream from the tailings line was 1,400 kilograms per meter cubed and the data from both pipe diameters match in the region of shear rate overlap because of the minimization of these thixotropic effects. The online rheometer did, however, produce higher viscosity values than the coet over the validation period, and this is due to the ubiquitous slip artifact common in coet geometry. The IOR is currently being upgraded to handle the large pressure swings, swings that we found on the operating plant, uh, experienced on the tailings line, and we expect the unit to be back on site early in September. Clarity is currently developing and updating the technical and maintenance manual, as well as an operator manual, which will form the basis of training program, which will be running on site for their personnel during the trial period following the reinstallation in September. So what are the next steps for the IOR? We are working with partners to find and assess new trial sites and ensure further validation of the online rheometer. This will help build confidence in the industry of its value. Further work is focused on simplifying the internal algorithm and moving the instrument from a scientific piece of equipment with a high degree of accuracy to a user needs fit for purpose implementation. That then allows an applied output that can be used by the operators on site directly and can remove the interpretation step required currently for real world outcomes. Determining the real time rheometry of multi-phase suspensions has only seen limited application in mineral processing and often gives misleading outputs. The IR has been designed using proven methods to overcome this by minimizing thixotropic effects and being able to detect and compensate for complications associated with settling material. Our plans for an IoT platform for the interfloat device is also being extended to the online rheometer, implementing common protocols and interfaces and seamless implementation across these applications. The online rheometer enables active control of suspension transport properties to optimize thickener performance, slurry transport, tailings deposition, and water recoveries. 
This is becoming increasingly important as industry needs to reduce its TSF footprint and extend its life of mine. I'll briefly touch on one of uh, the other CSO technologies that we're looking at, which is complementary to the online rheometer. The bed light detector, or BLD, has been designed to monitor the behavior of solids in a pipeline, in particular giving information on whether they are fully suspended, settling to the bottom of the pipe, or whether the solid bed is moving. The diagrams to the right show a visualization of the settled bed height across a section of the pipeline. and also a trend over time to monitor the growth or decline of the settled bed. The photo on the right is of a demonstration unit implemented at the CSRO on the 100 millimeter pipe loop, showing a settled bed of solid material. It is designed as a spool piece comprising sensors should be able to see there, along the internal diameter and no parts protruding into the fluid itself. So where to from here for clarity? Our core business currently centers on the implementation of new sensor technologies into live operating mine operations based on our experience and through increasing partnerships. Each implementation allows further experience to drive the implementation efficiency. We say that this work alone would be enough to sustain us and significantly grow our business, especially with the foresee foreseeable digitization of mines and the uptake of IoT by the mining industry. However, that space is expected to become crowded and we'll need to differentiate our offering through new and novel products, which are built using off-the-shelf processes, securely connecting them to the cloud, and distilling the information into dashboards that will create action. In this, we believe we are one or two steps ahead, especially for sites that don't already have an integrated control system, let alone a historian capability. To illustrate this potential, this is a traditional control infrastructure, commonly referred to as the IIT OT. In mining, these systems are only seen in large, longer life sites that have the capacity and resources to put these expensive systems into their operations. Conservatively, more than half of mining operations in Australia do not have such an infrastructure, and we see that as a huge opportunity. The interfloat can be used as an example. While we can connect these devices to tra traditional control systems, imagine that the sensor can talk sec securely to an established internet cloud wirelessly. This envisaged IoT connectivity is not intended for control, but rather for monitoring or reporting purposes. Here is a small targeted amount of data where it can be transferred, making it possible to generate a trend and potentially trigger action alarms, possibly as simple as an SMS. Unlike traditional historian infrastructure that relies upon an expensive DCS system, Clarity's IoT access to data can be deployed rapidly and inexpensively. As this kind of connectivity is independent of whether the operations have a control system, it enables mine operations that don't have any control or monitoring infrastructure to access targeted information anywhere and anytime on any platform 
without having to commit to significantly capital outlays. It could, in fact, be totally paid out of local sites operating funds if the sensor is leased with back-end services. So let me come back to the dashboards and what they could possibly look like. The cloud service that hosts the dashboards can be accessed using non-proprietary internet browsers and are able to generate reports, provide downloadable data, and notify key decision makers through a hierarchy of notification. The dashboard can be configured to give the information that the client wants and needs based on the site, instrument, and application. In this case, we have included the ability to toggle between a daily, monthly, and annual trend with the current values shown on the right, operating limits, and changes displayed based on the particular view. Monthly averages can be shown in a number of ways, and as on the bottom left, can give a quick historical overview over a longer period. The device's operation can be tracked, allowing notification of diagnostics, such as loss of power or signal. And further value can be added by showing best practice operating bands with the potential to raise an alarm or warning message, which can be pushed, for instance, to a computer, smart device, or SMS. Further potential lies in extending this type of dashboard to other technologies in the suite, as well as integrating legacy equipment commonly found in long life of mine operations. So to conclude, Clarity is actively looking for implementation opportunities where the technologies can be showcased on site. For these, successful implementation requires support from the industry or the instrument provider, the ability to conduct trial campaigns and validation on operating sites, and providing an ongoing support for the mining operations. Collaboration can be established where Clarity provides remote support for the on-site sensors. Potentially SMI, JKMRC establishes a student project using the technology or technologies and where the student conducts a trial and validation under JKMRC and university supervision. Finding suitable operating sites that value the potential, however, is essential. The technology cannot be covered by a typical vendor arrangement, and so customization to site requirements is critical to the success. The implementation and IoT solutions we are providing to CSRO at the moment and end users can equally be provided to any device, particularly if the device is still in the earlier stages of development. And with that, I thank you.